a legendary rainforest all of us have heard about, within which countless species, undiscovered and discovered alike, call it home, most of which are insects, and many of those ants, which is what I was looking for on my trip to the Amazon, Peru, last summer, a trip I will never forget. For what me and my friend joining me experienced along it, few people have. Living for weeks deep within the selva, in a rural village inhabited by traditional Avahun people, one of the over 50 indigenous groups still present and active in Peru. We had the honor of staying with one of these families during our visit, experiencing their wonderful culture and lifestyle whilst exploring the forest. But I am getting ahead of myself, how did I even get there? Well, it all started with me getting in contact with a person online. She was based in Peru and after talking back and forth for some months, she invited me to visit her and her family who lived within the Amazon, an offer which I could not refuse. I applied for a grant at the Stockholm Entomology Association, since the trip would not be cheap, and before I knew it, I was at the airport. Final destination, Chiclayo, Peru. This day was unreal. I know many of you watching yearn to visit something like the Amazon. I mean, it's absolutely legendary. And here I was, blessed to have gotten this opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, I decided to invite another ant nerd to join me on this trip, since having someone to nerd out with is always nice. After meeting my Norwegian friend in Amsterdam, we made our way over the Atlantic, made the landing in New York, but not long enough to visit the city, and after that, Central America landing in Panama, before our final destination, Chiclayo, Peru. Peru is a very diverse country, with a land area of 1.3 million square kilometers. This country sports more than half of the world's longest mountain range, the Andes within which some of the world's most famous ancient civilizations lived, such as the Inca and Nazca. Now, after a 46 hour long journey, we were finally landing in the northeastern city of Chiclayo. I was personally a bit surprised about how arid it was. Looking at a map and hearing about it is one thing, but the climate here was very similar to something like southern Spain. The semi-arid desert of western Peru is a very special climate, with the Andes separating it from the much more humid winds of the Amazon basin. In combination with the Humboldt current bringing cool water from deep within the Pacific, it creates a very dry and rain-poor area, which is in such high contrast to where we were heading next. After some time in this city, we made our way via a 7-hour bus across the Andes, arriving in Bagua, and this is where the real adventure started. With a grueling seven more hours of travel with a driver who were, let's just say, very, very used to these winding and dangerous pothole filled roads. My friend slept whilst I puked for literally the entire trip. Seven hours straight. Not a pleasant experience, but I would do it all again if it meant arriving in Nieva, our final, final destination. Immediately when stepping out of the car, the warm and extreme humid air hit us like a welcoming hug from the Amazon itself. But the Amazon is not famous for its warm winds, it is a rainforest after all. So just 30 minutes after our arrival, extremely heavy rainfall, by my standards at least, came from nowhere. The amount of water which just appeared from the sky was insane. Such heavy rainfall is very rare back in Sweden, perhaps showing itself once or twice a year. But here, even outside of the rainy season, it was basically every other day. We made our way with the family we would be staying with, who made us feel very welcome. The people of Nieva proved to us all along on our stay their extreme kindness and hospitality, offering so much I can't even begin to describe how kind these people were. A truly wonderful host family, thank you. But I mean, look at this view, I was in heaven. Before we knew it, we were taken to visit the family's elders by going in a chalupa, their long, shallow and slim riverboats, via the local river. My friend's expression tells it all. We were so excited. Arriving by this more traditional settlement, we were greeted by a horde of dogs, but since we were visiting with family members, they were very kind. We spoke to the grandfather about why we were there, which was to finance, and when we mentioned that, he keenly looked at us, and immediately took us to a place within his backyard medicinal garden, where he said very large black ants lived. And would you know it, Paraponera clavata in the flesh. For those of you who don't know, this is a bullet ant, the insect with the most potent venom in the world. And it was chilling in his backyard. I said it over and over again when we were there, but this was truly heaven. These little fellas lived at the base of a tree, which was where we found most of the colonies nesting too, during the length of our trip. 
I was in awe of how the mythical bullet ant was the first ant we saw on our trip. If anything, this was a very good omen. Bullet ants might look intimidating, and you should by no means show disrespect. They send a grown man crying in pain for 24 hours straight, many people reporting feverish side effects. But they are actually not as fierce as most think. They just want to be left alone. And being this close to ants, photographing and recording them, gentle movement and respect goes a long way. Another tip for recording and photographing them is to not breathe in their general direction, as that will alert their very sensitive antenna and it might make them even more defensive. But wait, there's more. This was our first day in the forest, and I could not be happier. But it was still early in the day, so we ventured out for a little day trip. Walking along these overgrown paths, taking what I back then thought was cool shots of the dense forest, I spotted something in the corner of my eye. A jittering motion by the size of an ant, and guess what? It was a Gigantiops destructor. I could cry in this moment. These guys are some of the most special ants on the planet, and I had one right in front of me. With their huge eyes and skittish movement, are they just not adorable? I remember sitting for four hours straight with a friend watching videos of these guys, fanboying over how amazing they were and how we both longed to one day see them. And here I was. I was truly humbled by this experience, and it was such a special encounter that I decided to get a tattoo of it when I came back to Sweden. It was truly amazing. For those of you who don't know, let me tell you why these guys are so special. As I said, their eyes are huge making up around 20% of the volume of the head. This already sets them apart from the vast majority of ants. But the cool thing is that these massive eyes enable them to maneuver the surroundings almost like a jumping spider, keenly scanning around the area for movement and hunting for smaller prey to take down, like springtails. Their stocky hind legs also act similar to jumping spiders as these ants skip around the forest floor, making their way over gaps in the leaf litter as you can see here by these awesome slow-mo shots captured by my friend at Ant Labs. Explaining their characteristically jittery movement I talked about earlier. It was hard to leave this finding behind and move on, but there was much to explore, and apparently they were pretty common here. Wild. Something that amazed me during all the times we went in the jungle was how overgrown everything was. I'm talking moss and lichen growing on live swaths of leaves, However, the ground was almost always barren. No top humus layer above the soil, meaning no aggregated biomass that had not broken down. Back home, the ground is always covered with moss, pine needles and leaves. Here, the moss had moved up to the stems of trees or heavily decomposed logs, and the ground was only littered with a thin layer of leaves. This is due to the Amazon having a much higher turnover rate when it comes to decomposition. Its humid and warm climate encourages rapid decomposition by fungus and bacteria, leaving little to no litter. This is one of the reasons why you might have heard that natural rainforest soil is pretty scarce in nutrients. The leaf litter and such simply does not have time to get buried and leave its nutrients deeper within the soil. It is all broken down at the top layer and quickly absorbed by the various organisms who call it home. Speaking of which, you might have seen that in many of these clips there is a machete man in front. Well, this was the lovely father of our host family who took us out in the jungle, cutting down the extremely dense plant matter in front of us as we walked through. This might seem very destructive and bad for an outsider, but what I just talked about helps ensure that this path will very soon be regrown. I asked him about this and his estimate was that this all would be regrown in about under a month which was insane to hear. Things truly grow fast here. When we walked these trails, it was fascinating to see so many plants which I was familiar with through expos and plant shops, but which was here just growing wildly. Really cool. During one of our hikes, we encountered this fella, a large katydid. No idea on the species or the genus of this big boy, but he sure could bite. My friend even brought out gloves for this which was probably a good idea, as this guy did not want to let go. Just a few meters beyond that katydid, we encountered a beautiful stick insect. I would guess it was a pretty young malt, but stunning colors. Some days later, we actually encountered another stick insect, this fellow, with a wonderful red color, which was even cooler in my opinion. And they were just walking on the ground whilst we trekked through the jungle. 
This trip truly humbled me in the sense that all my life I had seen these species in documentaries, photos, talked about them, seen them at expos, etc. But here they were, casually strolling through the thin leaf litter, nothing grandiose or spectacular, they just existed, like anything else. And you know what else exists here? Cacao fruits. Our wonderful host family had huge natural orchards of cacao, yucca, ginger and much more. I bet most people watching this has never seen the insides of a cacao fruit before. I sure hadn't. But let me tell you that this fruit was the sweetest thing that I have ever tasted. It was delicioso. The taste could also have been influenced by the fact that I was eating this as authentic as it gets, atop a hill above the canopy in the Amazon. Just a bit. One evening when we went home, again via their river chalupa boats, I realized that what I had been thinking was small birds actually was a ton of bats. Active only during the dusk and morning, these guys fly low above the water, catching small flying insects. Such a cool sight. Okay, but back to ants. What more did we see, you ask? Well, a ton of stuff. Let's start by showing this guy, an ectatoma worker, famous for their intense orange color and size, as well as their amazing ability to carry large droplets of liquid within their mandibles. Species like these often lack a social stomach, which most other ant species has, where they usually store water or other foods to later share with other workers from the colony and even the queen. This species lacks that and instead is forced to carry liquids like this, carrying it back to the colony for others to directly drink from. A little water boy in other words, just so cool. During our last dinner with the family, I showed them the pictures I had taken of their wonderful ant species, asking them what they were called in their native language. And to my surprise, they had a name for almost all of the famous species, something which I will get back to. But when I showed them this ectatoma, they all excitedly proclaimed that this is a super useful traditional medicinal ant. Their sting apparently helps remove liver spots. It is knowledge about nature like this that is so precious and that only is retained by local traditions, like with the Avahun people that I was with. Truly fascinating. I sadly never got to try this claim, but on my return visit in the future, I will for sure do that. Okay, we saw a lot of things on this trip, perhaps a little too much to share. So let's do a little rapid fire showcase. We saw many spiders whilst there, but no large tarantulas sadly, only tiny ones like these. Large millipedes were also a common sight, really cool seeing them in the wild after years of seeing similar species at expos. Another very abundant creature were butterflies. We saw plenty of green, blue and this one with see-through wings. No clue on the species and I apologize for the camera work, it was the only one we found. If you know the species of any of these, please let me know. I actually found another awesome insect whilst chilling in a hammock in one of their traditional houses. A huge roach species, which we only managed to see in the distance like this sadly, but still awesome. Another really cool find were these bullet ants being completely overrun by a rival ant colony, which I would say looks similar to Chromatogaster, but I could be completely wrong. It was a spectacular scene, with the larger bullet ants being helpless when swarmed, as you can see by these poor workers being completely stuck to the tree bark. Not too far away from that, we found one bullet ant which lacked a gaster, perhaps lost during the battle. I took this opportunity to handle it and feel its bite, something which most people get accompanied by a powerful sting, but let me tell you, their bite is not something to be played with either. Those mandibles could pinch real good. We didn't encounter that many reptiles or frogs, but the ones we did catch were very cute. One day, we were called over by one of our friends who had apparently found a really cool frog. She opened her hands to show us and it was an absolutely stunning specimen. I honestly thought it was completely fake at first. My travel buddy eagerly took it from her hands as we wanted to prepare some space where we could photograph it. But these guys are very slippery buggers, so it sadly didn't take long before he lost his grip and it jumped off into a piece of foliage. We looked for it for at least 15 minutes, but it was completely gone. Looking back at the footage, you can actually catch a little glimpse of it jumping away just outside of our field of vision. One day, like any other on this wonderful trip, our host wanted to take us to a local waterfall, something we were very excited to join in on. When we arrived there, there was a group of children playing by the water, and we casually walked up to the waterfall too. But as we got closer to the children, they saw me and my friend and immediately scurried away in fear. We asked our host why this was, 
and she told us that there were old stories of white people coming to these rural towns and stealing children. Realizing this, me and my friend attempted to change the children's perception about us and calmly waited for them to approach us instead. Curious as children are, one boy finally warmed up to us and was brave enough for a fist bump, but only as I looked the other way. After that, more and more realized that at least these two white people were friendly and it ended up with my friend and all the kids playing in the water together. A happy ending. Although I do not doubt that these stories were once upon a time sadly true, it is nice to know that these kids now at least have one memory of when white people were kind and friendly, in addition to the harsh warnings left by stories. Mantids was actually one of the creatures which we didn't really see that many of, but we did find one very abundant arboreal species, which were scurrying along these very white tree trunks, blending in perfectly. A very unique looking species for sure. But back to ants. One of the world's most special group of ants, leafcutters, lives in South America, and was an absolute must-see for us nerds upon visiting. Enough so that we freaked out when we found a single worker in the middle of the night when we were heading home by boat the first day. But that was nothing compared to the amazing sights we would later see. These fellas are extremely special, since they are solely relying on eating from their specially grown fungus. This fungus is cultivated deep underground. The fungus is fed leaves that the ants harvest from the surrounding area. When you think about it, it is a very intricate relationship these guys have with its fungus, who is only found within these nests of these special species. Beside the relationship between the ant and the fungus, there is an entire species of weed eating on this specific fungi only found inside of these nests. And in addition to this, certain workers even produce pesticides from special glands combating these weeds, as you can see by this worker being completely covered in this white powder. An incredible showcase of intricate symbiosis, and if you think about it, probably the first case of advanced agriculture. Just goes to show that once again, ants are the coolest animals on the planet. When recording these guys, I really wanted to get a shot of one of the workers eating through a leaf, so I set the camera up with lights for this time lapse, which was going great, until the light died. And as you can hear, no, I freaked out a bit. No, it's a calor. No, no, battery. I think so. Really? Hold them, Can you hold like for them? Oi, far me. And just as I had gotten a new battery inserted, as you can see, the ant was already done. Sadly, I am very sure other macro photographers out there can relate. Another amazingly adapted ant species are the army ants of South America, Echiton. We only saw these guys once, when they came running in very small trails on the outskirts of our camp, not the massive trails you see in documentaries, but still amazing. I even found a super major, with their massive jaws used to anchor down prey. These fellas are nomadic, not living in a traditional nest, instead they make their nest out of living workers called a biovac. With their nest being so malleable, they move their brood and queen wherever there is food decimating the entire forest floor, killing whatever they can find. Because of this immense pressure these species impose on their respective ecosystems, it is no wonder they are considered a vital keystone species. A really cool and special ant species for sure. Looking back, I regret not trying to follow the trails back to their biovac, but at the time we found them, we sadly didn't really have time. It will sadly have to wait until next time. Next up, termites. Obviously inferior to ants, but the scale of their structures are indeed impressive. Also, in my opinion, one of the coolest examples of convergent evolution between them and ants, as termites are closely related to roaches and mantids, thus far away from ants and their wasp relatives. I find it rather mesmerizing watching termites scurry about, since they are usually much more determined in their gait compared to ants, making their movements almost resemble a bloodstream. Pretty impressive. On our last day, we ventured out in the early morning, before sunrise, looking for snakes. Sadly, we didn't find any at all, probably due to the proximity of people, but what we did find was a bunch of cephalotus workers, a really cool genus with some crazy morphology. These guys are actually arboreal, but had all come down to eat on... whatever that was. The spikes on these guys are insane, and they were not small either, having a colony of them would probably be amazing. 
This trip was massive, and I have so much more to share. More stories like the one by the waterfall with the kids, and some very cool language lessons on how certain ant species are called by the native Avahun people. But that will all have to wait for another video. I hope to see you there, so why not subscribe? Finally, I want to extend a massive thank you to the wonderful Isminio family who invited us into their lives, sharing their amazing culture with two foreigners who they knew nothing of. And also a massive thank you to the Stockholm Entomological Society who made the trip possible in the first place by offering a very generous grant to me and my friend. Well, that was it for me. Catch you in the next one.